Welcome to the Earthworks Podcast, where our team will share the jargon of carbon from many of our turf friends from the past 30 years. Hi, everybody. I'm Joel Simmons for another Earthworks Podcast. I am uh, very excited to have the recipient, if I can hold this up properly. Oh, God, you had to break that up. The Cape Crusader with us. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Matt Crowther. I got your name right. Uh, Perfect. From the Cape Cod Country Club in New England. I think I've known you for 25 years. It's got to be a long Probably. time. Probably. We would hang out often at either the GIS or certainly at the Providence Show. You are our very first guest from New England and certainly our first guest from Cape Cod. So uh, you have been quite the... Um, you have been quite the, uh, you know, the, the star in the golf course industry in the last <laughs> number of weeks. So, uh, it, you know, you have been, um, you are the 2021 recipient of the GCSAA's President's Award for Environmental Stewardship. And I congratulate you for that. I think that's fantastic. Uh, I looked it up. I have the magazine like I just showed everybody. But, it, you know, the company that you hold in here is pretty, pretty darn impressive. In fact, last year, a good friend of ours, Gary Ingram, who uh, who manages a golf course out on the uh, tarpac tarmacs of uh, Oklahoma's, or excuse me, of uh, Oakland, California's um, um, uh, airport, is uh, it was the uh, recipient of this award a year ago. And I remember talking to Gary. I don't know if you know Gary, but uh, first time yeah. I met. I first time I met Gary, he had uh, he'd shown me some some uh, stuff, and it was all sodium. So he's got some really tough environmental issues. So you've also recently been on TurfNet. I know John interviewed you on TurfNet. You've been on Golf Nation. Uh, you've been. You told me yesterday you were on the Mass Golf. Uh, is that association uh, interview? And now, of course, the Coup de Gras. You get to sit here with me on the Earthworks <laughs> podcast. So congratulations for all of that accolade. Well deserved. Uh, what what the heck is the President's Award for Environmental Stewardship? How do you get it? Did you, did you campaign for it? Did you have to pay somebody off? How, how did you actually get this thing? Um, well, first of all, uh, thank you for inviting me to be on this. I'm, I'm honored. You've got uh, some some really high uh, you know highfalutin guests that I've listened to, and uh, I'm humbled to be in their to be in their company. Right? I'm I'm just a guy. Let me just. Crusader, dude. I, 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 I get that. I'm getting my 15 minutes of fame, but I just want everyone to know, listening to this or watching this, that I, I'm just a guy. Um, you know, I've been in this business for 30 years or 35 years. I'm never going to get my picture on the cover of PCM <laughs> magazine. So, congratulations, my friend. Well, thank you. I, I do appreciate it, and uh, I'm certainly proud of the work that I did there at uh, Mink Meadows. And you know, I'm not sure how you get it because I never. Uh, I never sought it out. I, I I was in such shock. Uh, the people listening and watching this that know me won't believe when I say that I was speechless when John Fulling called me. I uh, I knew John a little bit because we were delegates together a hundred years ago when he was starting out uh, politically with GCSAA. Um, I think. About the time that I was there was the time it started to become the route to the board. Um, quite a few people, um, uh, Rafael Barajas, um, past president now, was a delegate when I was a delegate. And so it seemed like that was the feeder route. Um, and so it's just been interesting um, that a bunch of the ones that were delegates with me have all now gone through the board. Right. And um, so I never did ask them how you know this well, thing I mean, even happens yeah. is is there a committee is there uh you know so I don't, i'm not sure how you get it um were there other people in the running do you even know that no i, I don't i don't yeah I no came to you and said it's your turn you're on the only the only thing I really know about it, Joel, to be honest, is I got a great handwritten letter from Paul Carter, who's also a former um, uh, superintendent of the year with TurfNet, who I got to know um, on, on one of those TurfNet trips that I was on with him. And he sent me a nice handwritten note congratulating me and said that he was on the committee. So I know there's a committee. There is a committee. I do know that. <laughs> how, how they get nominated, I don't know, but um, it is going to be my life's mission. I'll say it here um, in front of you. It's going to be my life's mission to try to get Mark Hoban um, the award. 
for the work he's doing down at Rivermont. Um, I mean, Randy Wilson with TurfNet is doing tremendous videos um, that make us all laugh and cry at times because they're funny, but also he's done some great serious pieces highlighting the work being done down at Rivermont. Yeah. And Mark is a thousand times more deserving than I am. I mean, he's just, he's a scientist he's drilling this thing down. Yeah, he's a scientist. I mean, he is, he's really, you're right, he's dialed it down. He's, uh, I've talked to Mark a number of times and he always asks great questions and he, he gets it. And he's really, really excited about it as, you know, as are you. And I, I honestly believe knowing you as long as I have that you are definitely deserving of this particular award. I mean, the work you've done over the years has been really impressive and being out you know on the vineyard and and if if you folks don't know Martha's Vineyard it's a tiny little island out in the water and 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 I I think you told me this yesterday I always thought there was three golf courses there's four on the island uh yeah I mean technically there could be um me, Farm Neck, Eggertown, Vineyard Golf. Technically, there could be five, right? Chappaquiddick has okay. – um, uh, used to be six holes. Now it's it's nine holes. The greens are probably the size of my office. Um, it's really a mom-and-pop kind of operation, but they, they, they call it the Royal and Ancient Chappaquiddick Golf Club. They swear they're the oldest course in, you know, this side of uh, the Atlantic. Uh, oh, really? Know. I didn't know that. Either. Oh, yeah. They've been around forever, apparently. So I've never played it. I've been on it um, once, uh, walked it to try to help um, the owner, you know, get through some rough patch that he had and so forth. But, um, yeah, so there, there's four full-size regulation golf courses with, you know, pro shops and ranges and regulation. And then there's the, the Chappie course. Um Interesting. You know, let's let's start at the very beginning, Mac, because a lot of people don't know you unless they're you know a local New Englander and and have the chance to you know see you at Providence. Of course, the TurfNet folks probably all know you because you've been very active with Peter uh, for a long time. But talk to me about you know let's get, let's go back to the beginning. And uh, you and I chatted a little bit yesterday, and there were a couple things in that beginning of yours, like you having worked with Frank Rossi when he was a master <laughs> student, and a few other things. But start at the beginning before you got up to Mink Man. And then we'll get into Mink Meadows and uh, and talk about the whole environmental thing. But, you know, tell us who you are and your background, how you got into this. Song. So the quick elevator speech, um, to keep it very quick, is I had a passion for the yard work with my father, right? My father loved his lawn. Um, you know, we planted annuals every year. He had a garden. Um, I never... For whatever reason, I never slid into the gardening side, but I have a sister who lives in Vermont and is a true Vermonter. She probably grows 80% of the food that she eats. Um, My brother's a big gardener. He tends to grow a little bit more weed um, than anything, uh, you know, (laughs) more than than vegetables. But um, and my and my son is an avid uh, gardener as well and and built a hugelkultur bed in my backyard in Sandwich um, before we were even living there because he had read a book on hugelkultur. And so it seems to be a passion in our family to grow stuff. So it's it's not just me. I'm just the the idiot who chose to do it for money. for the rest of your life. And so it really started when I was in um, junior high school, actually. We had a home ec teacher who had a grandparents. Um, the, the, her grandparents had this probably 100-acre farm where they had cultivated blueberries and they had a grape arbor and they had uh, hang fields and canning sheds. And they were in their 80s, 90s. And they were looking for somebody to show up and mow the grass. And so she go. asked a bunch of us in class if we had any interest. So I would ride my bicycle. I, that was my first summer job. I, I ride my bicycle probably five, eight miles to this place um, for a couple of summers. And then I worked at a Royal Crest, um, which is a, a local um, Massachusetts uh, uh, high-end uh, apartment complex. So I did that in high school, worked on a ground screw there, was not a golfer, 
um, decided to, yeah, had never really played. I played once in high school with uh, some of the hockey players that I played hockey with that were on the golf team. And I played, I think, half the round right-handed, half the round left-handed because I I shoot hockey left and baseball left. Well, that explains your golf game now, doesn't it? (laughs) I started right-handed in golf. It took me a long time to figure out that weight shift. So I I went to the University of Rhode Island as a landscape architect major. Ah, there you go. But started working immediately that first year in turf research. And Dr. Scobley, every time I would see him in passing in the hallway, wherever it might have been, he'd say, oh, you know, how's it going, Matt? You know, have you ever thought about turf? Did I ever tell you I have a son who's a landscape architect? So he would always, like, counter it with, I've got a son who's, you know, there's nothing wrong with being a landscape architect, but, boy, that turf is really where you want to be. So I tried to get a job at a nursery, and I applied to a bunch of them. There's a bunch of nurseries still in Rhode Island uh, growing nursery stock because I needed to start learning plant material. I didn't really know an oak tree from an elm tree. So to be a landscape architect major, so none of them got back to me. I was paying my own way through school. So I just called Scobley and said, Doc, get me a job at this golf course called Potawatomi. It was uh, a, a course name I had heard in the house because one of my father's bosses was a member there at one time. It was about 20 minutes from the house. And so I went there and worked for Mark Richard, uh, who just retired from um, a golf course in Rhode Island after 45 years of being a superintendent. And so Mark was the president of the Rhode Island superintendents at the time. We hosted the New England Amateur that summer. And I was pretty much hooked. There you go. And so I worked for um, another Rhode Island superintendent, Don Silver, in Rhode Island at Warwick Country Club, my last summer on a golf course. And I did my internship down in Long Island at Middle Bay Country Club for John Carlone. Oh, I didn't know which that. Which you may not remember. Yeah. I did not know that. Yeah, I know John. I think it was John's second, third year. It was pretty early for him, and um, he was one of the best guys I ever worked for. And so, And I had been to Long Island as a kid a bunch of times. I have some family in, in Long Island, and I spent that summer there. That would have been 1986, I think. And I just said to myself, too many cars and too many people, yeah, right? Exactly. Man, I, uh, Not quite wow. like Martha's Vineyard or the Cape. Well, right. And so I, I had no, I, I had no, you know, real plan for where I was going to be or what I was going to do. And the first job that popped up um, for me leaving college was Pinebrook Country Club up in Massachusetts. So um I, I got that job and I worked there for two different superintendents and I was there for six seasons and then got a job on Martha's Vineyard. And so I never really consider myself um, a big risk taker. Uh, I'm really a homebody, but I guess it took some kind of, you know, chutzpah and, and risk taking to move a young family out to, uh, you know, an island. So you were uh, married with son at that time when you went out to Martha's Vineyard. Yeah, my wife Cheryl and I uh, got married. Uh, we got engaged that summer. I was at Potawatomi and got married that summer. I was at Warwick Country Club. I should have graduated in in May that year, but um, never professed to be uh, a very good student or the smartest person right. in any room. So I was on the four and a half year plan. So I was well. <laughs> uh, I was going to school my last semester married. Um, and uh, had both my mother and my wife nagging me to make sure I studied so I would actually graduate. Yeah, and, I was, and I was in Dr. Jackson's office just about every day saying, Doc, you got to get me a job. These women are driving me crazy, right? I got to get out of here. And so I went up to Bybrook and then ended up moving out. Our son, Josh, was uh, four when we moved out there, and so he pretty much grew up there and and uh, so you lived on the island full time. You you weren't going back and forth or doing any of that silliness. You, you know, we, we we moved there and lived above the clubhouse. There was an apartment above the clubhouse that came with the job, a two bedroom apartment. And um, about halfway through our time out there, they tore the clubhouse down and built a new one. And uh, I always told people the, the best thing that came out of that new clubhouse was the improvement to uh to the apartment. The apartment got a lot better. The clubhouse got a little better. So but, they rebuilt the clubhouse, but more importantly, rebuilt your home. 
Yeah, exactly. The you know the bedrooms got a little bigger. I got central air. We got a dining room, so it was it was it worked out great. Yeah. What was it like living on a rock? I mean, you lived there for you were how long were you at Mink Meadow? You were there for uh, 20, 23 years. Wow. Yeah, we we moved there in November of ninety five, and um, we moved off full time in March of twenty nineteen. What was it like, uh, just, you know, personally, what was it like living on a rock? I mean, I'm sure the summers were radically different than uh, than the winters and the rest of the season, but what, what was it like? I mean, how would you describe that? When we moved there, they said the population year-round was 8,000, and when we left, it was more like 20,000, and it would swell up to a hundred to 125,000 on any given day in the summertime. Really, go from eight thousand to or, or twenty thousand, even to a hundred thousand. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so in in the winters, it was it was very quiet. Uh, there was no stoplights. There's still no stoplights, to, to to my recollection. And you know, most of the stores closed down. Um, it wasn't. It wasn't. I've never been to Block Island, even though I'm from Rhode Island. But uh, it, it wasn't like even Nantucket only has one town. Um, Martha's Vineyard is a little bigger and it has, I think, five towns. And so there's at least four main downtowns that have generally restaurants. I mean, our town of uh, Tisbury was just starting to get restaurants because up until a few years ago, it was a dry town. Oh, really? So the restaurants just were not encouraged well because yeah, we're going to do it without a couple uh you can't really have a cocktail you well if you can't sell alcohol you can't make money i mean you don't make money on the food uh we don't make we don't make all our money on green fees right it's golf carts and booze and food that we're making the real cash on so um and anybody that's in a private setting with a restaurant is probably going we don't make any money on food right <laughs> did it ever did it ever drive you nuts living on the rock i mean you're living out there in the middle of nothing for I mean, I, I talked. I, I work a lot in Bermuda, and I know those guys refer to the island there as the Rock, and it's they get a little rock crazy, you know. It's just this weirdness, and and Martha's Vineyard is nothing compared to say Bermuda. I can't imagine it wouldn't be a little crazy at some point. You know, it's funny because I I have my mother right now. Uh, she's eighty one. She's you know. She doesn't do much to begin with now anyway, right? She hasn't. She was uh, one of those uh, demo food cart ladies at BJ's. And so that got cut down with COVID. And so that's put a real cramp on her her activities, I guess, and with things being closed. But, you know, I talk to my mother fairly regularly. And so I don't think she had this crazy social life. But just the fact that COVID has shut her down, that she, she can't do what she wants to do, and so she's complaining all the time to me when we talk. And I just, you know, between her and other people, my wife working from home now, I'm saying this reminds me a lot of living on the vineyard where it's just an attitude that some people have. And you're just isolated. You just you either have it or you don't. And so I never really felt trapped out there. But I also never allowed myself to be trapped, right? Um, I was very active in the Cape Association. I went through all the board positions. I was active at the national level, being a delegate, going to delegate meetings. And, and, you know, I just never allowed the island and and the transportation of being on and off it to make me feel isolated or trapped. Yeah. And, and so the COVID shutdown hasn't really like you're, you're, you're used to it. Uh, this is just like normal for me. Yeah, yeah. Well, I still get I still get to get up, leave, and go to work every day, and then go right. home. Uh, and I'm kind of a homebody, right? I mean, you and I talked yesterday. We were talking about the uh, some of the legendary Irwin parties that used to happen here at Cape let's Cod. Let's not talk about that. It, it was it was a three day weekend event um, with golf and extra. But as I said to you, you know, I've been at the start of many an Irwin uh, function, but never an end. So I'm just not one of those guys that goes out and, and, you know, even GIS, I do enjoy the side ventures, but I just never found myself hanging out forever and ever, you know, talking to guys because I can't change my schedule. Um, I, I'm up at three thirty, four o'clock, and I'm in bed at seven thirty, eight o'clock. So you know, it's just hard. 
Matt's referring to our friends at the Tom Irwin Company, who is uh, our business partners and distributor out there. And I guess that's how we really get to spend some time together is through some of the uh, Tom Irwin. And, and they're a wonderful organization. Uh, and, and you know, we, we love working with them and they've done some amazing things. And actually, we're going to be doing the uh, uh, the innovation seminar with them this week. As a matter of fact, tomorrow. I hope Tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, let's let's get into this whole environmental thing. So so this whole thing. I mean, obviously this this award that you just received, the President's Award for Environmental Stewardship, wasn't a one year system. I mean, this was really a culmination of all of those twenty some years you were working out there in Mink Meadows. And and I think for most folks that uh, you know uh, know Martha's Vineyard, you know, you guys have always been touted as this environmental uh, you know hub because uh, of all the work that's been done at some of the other golf courses and obviously yours as is evidence of this award but what um you know let's get into the environmental thing and talk a little bit about what environmentalism means i mean we as an industry have gotten criticized so many times uh for not being wonderfully uh environmental obviously the work that we do here at earthworks and with you folks you know we're trying to be as environmental as we can at least from a soil standpoint although i would certainly say and i think you and i talked about this yesterday I don't know that I would ever see or even promote a organic golf course. I'm not sure that that's even feasible, but I, I do know, uh, and I, I can say this comfortably from 30 years of doing this, that if we can capture more carbon into the soil, we can reduce inputs. And that's certainly one of the things that uh, you've taught us and the folks at Tom Irwin have taught us is that we can reduce inputs and, and make a big change. But let's get into this environmental thing. What what did you do um, that got you this award? What was the environmental um, statement that you were making so basically how it started was um that was my first job so i had only worked at private country clubs right. uh had never even worked at a, at a public golf course before and so i go out to this nine hole semi-private um, golf course on martha's vineyard and i it was my first superintendent's job so like everything, I tried to, uh, I tell people the story, my first summer there, I tried to be the GCSAA poster child. I was going to wear pants and I was going to, and, you know, just be dressed that way. And, yeah, yeah. And so it wasn't even hard. I don't think we got above 75 that first summer degrees. It was beautiful. The next summer, it was probably 80 and humid in June, and I was the first one wearing shorts on the crew, right? I was like, yeah, I'm done with this. Right? <laughs> that's enough trying to impress anybody. Yeah, that's that's enough. I'm done with that. I'm going to be me now. But So when I went out there, I just – I don't know. I took a, a wait-and-see approach on a lot of things, right? It, it was kind of a – why am I going to do exactly what I've been doing at every other golf course that I've learned when I'm moving to an island? I, you know, I, I used to say to myself, do they even have Japanese beetles out here? Do I have white grubs? Do I have to fight white? You know, I don't know. I don't know. Do, do they have crabgrass? I, I don't know. And so once you kind of make the switch and that's the way I really like to, to think of it is I think all superintendents at their heart are environmentalists. I would agree. Some of us, I think just go an extra step. Yeah. Um, and that extra step sometimes could be questioning your own sanity, which I did for, for many years, um, whether what I was doing made any sense. And you and I talked about that yesterday where, um, and I'll give you the, I'll give you the quick basics, right? So it, it fundamentally bothered me to apply a fertilizer, let's say with a crabgrass preventative wall to wall when you don't get crabgrass wall to wall. Right. Um, it bothered me to spray an insecticide wall to wall for grubs and you don't get grub damage wall to wall. So I just kind of waited out that stuff and for years didn't do a um, pre-emergent uh, herbicide, but would spray crabgrass post-emergent. And I got away with it for a number of years, but I started overseeding my fairways heavily with colonial bank grasses. And going back to the not being the sharpest knife uh, in the drawer, didn't realize they're not very happy with herbicides. Right. And so I sprayed every form of, uh, you know, quinaclorac they made. And I just kept 
dinging up these colonials. And finally, probably Greg and Ed Irwin said, you know, you really it's all about the colonials. You probably should start spraying pre-emergent. And it broke my heart, but I went, started spraying wall-to-wall pre-emergent and then had very little post to do after that. And it's just, that's why I did it. But I still, only three times in 23 years did I spray for grubs. Oh, really? Instead, yeah. Instead, we'd get damage in fairways and some tea banks or bunker banks or whatever, and we just fix the damage and go. It, 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 it wasn't crippling. So, so you're uh, really taking an IPM approach. I mean, you're really looking at this very selectively, and instead of going this wall to wall approach that uh, unfortunately uh, has been a model for for a few, uh, you're really kind of going in there and taking a very selective approach at everything. <laughs> It, it was just kind of a mindset, right? It was it was kind of a, a, a holistic view, if you will. I, I was not opposed to using chemicals. I sprayed fungicides preventatively the first two seasons I was there. When I got there, um, there was a retired superintendent by the name of John Dolan who was on the crew. And he was a Rhode Island super and, and Southern Mass area superintendent. And I think he was doing the spraying. And I think he was really the guy making the bigger decisions because because the superintendent was the son of a pro super at Woods Hole for 40 years, oh, legend at Woods Hole Golf Club. But he was a class A pro. He had a class A card. So he was more from the pro side, had worked on the grounds crews for his father, but I don't think that was really his specialty. And I think John probably, uh, John Dolan probably helped him out, and he was a fabulous guy. We're talking a World War II Marine, greatest generation. He was, he was awesome. And when I got there, I knew he was an asset, but he really was like – I'm just happy to mow fairways or do, you know, he had no interest in being a superintendent, right? Because he retired. So that was great. But I didn't know what the program was. My speculation is that they were spraying curatively. And, you know, that was kind of it. I literally was given a scrap of paper out of the superintendent's wallet. We worked, we're supposed to work together for a week. I think we did three, four days and then he bailed and he reached into his wallet and handed me a piece of paper. And it was the phone number to the guy who uh, uh, designed the pump station panel. Oh, great. That that was the only record I, I had. No spray records, no weather records, nothing. Well, and so, I guess in some ways that's not a bad thing because you got to write your own script. You didn't exactly, but so I walked into a seventy-year-old golf course or something, sixty-five-year-old golf course, and had no history. So I sprayed for two years, wall to wall, greens, tees, fairways, preventatively with fungicides, and then had Why? actually because, because you had fungus, or you because you had disease issues, or were you just uh, nervous? Because it was my first job, and uh, I I knew yeah. yeah if I knew I did that you know, I would have good turf. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of guys do that, especially on new properties. They're nervous. It's a new job. You got to be careful. And it's, it's not an easy thing, uh, you know, to, to have that level of responsibility. And you were still, even at that time, a young guy. Yeah. I think I was 24 when I moved there. Um, and so, yeah, you, you know, there's a, there's an inherent fear of screwing up, right? Um, you know, yeah, when I became the newsletter editor for the Cape association, you know, that was my main job, my main goal. Not to screw up? Don't screw it up. Yeah, don't right? screw up. Just try, you know, I didn't, I didn't plan to be the best editor in the world. I just didn't want to screw it up. Right, exactly. So I, I was battling red thread in the spring, right? Fertility was an issue. My soils probably were not as strong as they were when I left. And so we have such cold, miserable springs on the Cape and the islands. Uh, we have wonderful falls. But springs are horrible, right? So the water takes forever to to heat up, and then it takes a long time to cool down. So in the fall, it can be fabulous out there in November and December. And March and April are miserable. I tell people we could mow fairways in May with, with Carhartt suits on. Oh, really? Well, if the breeze comes off the water, the water is still 40. Yeah. So it's just a raw, brutal, cold, damp wind that just, you know, gets into your bones. So so I battled Red Thread in the spring the first two years. So I'm starting my third year. I had penciled in, I think, a fifth fungicide spray. I was going to spray fungicide preventatively for Red Thread, of all things, right? 
But my mindset was, I don't want to start the year backwards. We were a very busy golf course, right? We were we yeah. were one, one of only two public, you know, accessible golf courses on the island. So we weren't as busy as Farm Neck, but we were busy. We were doing probably in those days 27,000 rounds a year. Wow. Um, and a lot of it was in the summertime, but we awesome. sold, yeah. we sold an off-season membership as well. So we played there year-round. Oh, I and know. yeah. And so anyway, I just didn't want to start backwards. Right. And so so then my salesman for, I don't know, pick a company. He's with Harold's now. But, you know, it's just the, the big brother scenario where, you know, companies were getting gobbled up. So he was with Eco Soils at the time. He's still one of my main guys, Chuck Bramhall. But uh, Chucky comes in and pitches the Biojet. Right, just, right. I want to let you know, it's part of our portfolio. He's the guy I've just bought the five sprays from, so right. it, it doesn't exactly. face him. And I jumped in cold turkey with both feet and yeah. said, all right, cancel the five fungicides for fairways, and I'm going to use this bioject on fairways. Done. A lot of people probably don't know, especially the younger crowd uh, in our audience, probably don't even know what the Bioject is. Uh, what was what? Explain the Bioject system. I mean, this is truly one of the very first, um, you know, systems uh, that was dealing with biological, um, you know, controls. Uh, and this is going back into the early '90s. And you were getting there. You, what year are we talking about with you? I started that in uh, 98. There you go. So yes. what is the Bioject? Tell us about the Bioject. So, so the Bioject was developed uh, by a company called EcoSoils. Uh, Dr. Joe Vargas and his team at Michigan State had isolated a naturally occurring bacteria called uh, Pseudomonas aerophacins. And it, he, he found that it would suppress... Uh, the dollar spot fungus. Yeah. And the problem with it was that in order to get through the EPA, the bacteria needed to be proven that it would die in sunlight, right? Wouldn't be harmful to people. Right, right. So if it got on your skin or anything like that, it was not a, a you know, an issue. So the problem with that is it didn't last, so you had to apply it regularly. So the initial way that they would apply this was through the irrigation system. You would run a syringe cycle, you would inject it, and then inject it while the water was going out, and you would put it out as kind of a, a, a preventative through your irrigation system. And I did that for, we'll call it 10 years. Yeah. 12 years. And I had a saltwater intrusion problem. And so that was the big reason I decided to stop injecting it and decided to spray it uh, through my sprayer. I bought a new 300 gallon sprayer. And so for the last seven or eight years that I was out there, I was spraying it as kind of a curative fungicide, if you will. As soon as I saw any little slight haze beginning of dollar spot on fairways, I'd brew a batch. It took about 14 hours, 12, 14 hours to brew a batch. And I'd spray it and brew, spray. And I'd do that about three days in a row and then get a week or two off and then have to do it again a week or two off. So I was spraying my fairways potentially 30 times. With the, with the inoculant. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, what, what, why did you go from the uh, irrigation to the spray tank? Just because of the salt in, infusion in the in the irrigation water? Yeah. So I, I had uh, I had shift I, I had shifted to a to try to do more deep watering. Gotcha. And try to use less water. I mean, anytime I was watering, I was putting salt out there. So I was just trying to figure out two things at the same time. And and so I said, I, I just I, there's only so much watering window. We had six a.m. tea times. And in the summertime, in the early days, we were busy from 6 a.m. till dark. I mean, I'd be in the apartment above the clubhouse watching TV, falling asleep, and hear people coming in in the dark. It's like, where the hell have they – how long have they been out there? I didn't realize you had to brew the Biojack. So you were brewing it, and you it was a few days to get the uh, system ready to spray? It, it took a day. Um, it took 12 hours. So it was essentially a day for it to brew a batch and you could either have it sit in the machine or automatically offload. So I would automatically offload into or you could inject. 
And so when I was using it as a, as a fungicide, essentially, if you will, I would have it dumped into my sprayer. I parked my sprayer right next to it. And then I would take out like four gallons. It made, I want to say 26 gallons, 28 gallons was the size of the tank, something like that. So I take out four gallons in a, in a five gallon bucket, put it off to the side. And I figured out I could spray. I put some boomless nozzles on the back of my sprayer and I was spraying at maybe a gallon per thousand. And I could, and then I found out I could, I could fly because there's really no rate to this. Right. So I would go in like third gear and just fly and I could spray, um, six and a half fairways, let's say, um, with one tank. Yeah. And then come in, put in 30 gallons of water, put in the four gallons, and go do the last fairway and a half. So the idea is that you're basically covering the leaf, and, and that, that inoculant would devour whatever fungi might be on the leaf. So it's not necessarily treating soil as much as it is kind of coating the leaf and taking away whatever uh, pathogen might be sitting on the leaf. <laughs> Yeah, and to be honest with you, I think Kenny uh, Ken Braun, who owns the Bioject uh, franchise now, um, I, he was the first one to explain it to me, and I, I'm pretty sure this has been studied and proven, but I think what they discovered happens is when the bacteria dies, it actually secretes something, and that's what – yeah. 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 Did you, some, ever, did you ever play with compost tea on the island? I I didn't. Um, I probably should have, and that probably was going to be like a next logical step. But again, so to, just to kind of bring it all full circle, you and I talked yesterday. I tried for I think two seasons to not spray a fungicide on my fairway. I'm on teas. Yeah. And I told you at that time, you know, the teas were a little smaller. I had, you know, we, we were under construction, I think, my second year through my 19th year, whether it was uh, adding teas. So we had a, a, a variation from front to back being a nine hole golf course. Uh, we added a new putting green location and we added a second green on a hole. We rebuilt a couple of greens. We did a bunch of bunkers and then. 20 years later, had to start rebuilding some of those bunkers, and we did a forward tee movement to add more tees for um, beginners and uh, older women and so forth, so to get more variation for them. And so I tried in the beginning to not spray tees, and I told you by August our tees would be 50% divot mix and 50% grass, and then I'd get whacked overnight with Dollar Spot, and I'd say to myself, you know, you have a half an acre, an acre of tees, and, you know, what is that? Four ounces of a product, right, you know? Exactly. So I just, I said the hell with it. I started spraying teas preventatively again. And, um, I always sprayed my greens preventatively with fungicides. So my, my mindset was it's, it's public golf, even though I had 260 members or something, it's public golf. Got a lot of rounds and in a short period. It's a it's a lot of rounds. It's a short period of time. You know, Clinton used to play there. Obama played there. You know, it's we we had some high profile people. Those must have been fun days for you. <laughs> they were they were exciting. It, yeah, it was a lot of fun. And so you know, every golf course lives and dies by its greens. Yeah. And so you know, I tried to to have the greens as good as I possibly could. And so I never really tried to get too wonky with them as far as my uh, uh, proclivities for, for, you know, minimalist uh, approach. And so it was really fairways, rough, tees for a few years. And so I went 20 straight seasons without a fungicide on fairways. In fact, um, I sprayed one fungicide on fairways in that 20 years and it was year 17 i think or something and what happened was the the way the bag the bioject works is it has bags of sugar uh media that stimulate need to, the microbes and stimulate the, the microbes to, to to brew and so uh kenny would set me up so i was good for a month or something yeah. and it would be four boxes of two different kinds of media and he forever daisy chained them one to the other and then this year he didn't daisy chain them and so when i pulled my sprayer in next to the bioject 
I could hardly see everything. And so I'd look at it and I'd look at the top box and say, yeah, there's stuff in it. I can see there's stuff in it, but it wasn't connected to the bottom box. Coming in. So I ran out of sugars. So I'm brewing and spraying and brewing and spraying and I'm getting crushed with dollar spot, just absolutely decimated. These things, you know, people would think you'd get fired for the amount of dollar spot I was having. Nobody even they knows. Do. They were just playing. So I finally left the machine outside of the building and walked to the machine and walked around the bioject and started cursing a blue streak for Kenny and nice. got out the alcohol and sterilized everything and connected the other boxes and brewed and sprayed. But before I had figured that out, I broke down and I sprayed a, a preventative rate of a newer fungicide yeah. on the fairways wall to wall yeah. and it didn't touch it. Really? Didn't touch it because it was a, it was it was it was a preventative rate. Ah, uh, gotcha. And I was crushed. It was active. It looked like snow or pythium. And so then I figured out the bioject and I fixed it. I brewed and sprayed, and within two days, no more active. Gave it a little liquid fertilizer, and it okay. it grew out of it and came back. And so the last three years I was there, we were under fertilizer regulations that were fairly strict. And so I had gone to just a straight all liquid program. Yeah. It was easier to meet the regs and just dump it in with the biojet. Yeah, even on the greens? No, 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 no. Uh, I, I, I probably broke a few of the fertilizer regulations, um, you know, by using uh, Earthworks 545 because this, <laughs> the Commonwealth of Massachusetts banned phosphorus, um, but the, the local vineyard regulations – were more about nitrogen, so it met oh, the right. nitrogen. It met the the nitrogen requirements, I believe, because um, there's not a lot of uh, um, fast acting nitrogen, right? I think we had to be 60% win water insoluble nitrogen. Uh, you couldn't put on more than a half a pound per application or something, and you could only you had to be 30 days apart between applications. And I think it was March. I think it was April 1st or April 15th to October 15th. Yeah. So you couldn't use any fertilizer outside of those uh, time frames. And so I remember one of my favorite earthwork stories was um, based right around the Providence show in March. It was always the first week in March. Okay. And we would get snow on Martha's Vineyard occasionally. Sometimes it wouldn't last long. Sometimes it would last a month. But so we, you know, as every golf course does, get inundated with sledders and skiers. And so I had cross-country skiers going across the greens, and they made tracks. And this one green was mostly POA at the time and just didn't look good. It had this kind of yellowy – there was tracks on it too that had – and so – I had um, one of my guys grab a bag of 545 and spread some 545 on this green, and they were calling for snow, um, like another inch or two. And so I said, just go give it a little dusting, and I'm taking off going to the off island to Providence for three days for the for the New England Regional Turfgrass Conference. And I came back from the conference, and the green looked perfect. It was green. It, it, it just bounced right back. The snow melted in a day, so the snow just kind of melted in the 545, and it, was, it, was, it worked perfectly. It wasn't growing. You know, the high temps were still 40 uh, at best, and the night times were probably 35, 32, you know. And that's, so we're in that pattern right now uh, this week, and I'm nervous as hell because we're covered in snow mostly, and we got a quarter of an inch of rain yesterday maybe and then dropped down to – 28 last night i, I so have to tell i have to tell everybody that i did not pay you to talk about the five for five but, <laughs> but i do thank you because it's certainly been the history of that product let me put you on the spot a little bit and if if this is something that uh, the rec you know the the, the uh, recognition doesn't uh, come back easily just let me know but um i know you did a lot of soil testing out there on the cape what was the what was the core soil chemistry like let me let me kind of go back and start at the beginning and then work our way back what was the uh, battle you fought or what were the changes you had to make early on from a core chemistry standpoint based on those soil tests that you guys were doing 
Greens weren't bad. Um, they were uh, – the course was 1936, I believe. Oh, they, yeah, actu yeah. they actually put – it was the last course by um, uh, a, a great New England architect, really, I think uh, grossly underrated, Wayne Stiles. Yeah. So it was Wayne Stiles' last golf course, 1936. And they actually incorporated clay into the greens mix. So at the very bottom of a cup cutter, because they were 70 years old when I was there, we had our 75th. And so um, at the bottom of the cup cutter, there was a red clay. And the only place I had ever seen this red clay on the property. So my main line was down uh, seven, six to seven feet. Yeah. It was at Frost Cone. And so we had a few problems and had to dig down to main line. So we, we had a pit. Um, on one part of the course where we mined for material to build some of the tees and stuff. So I dug a lot of holes in that property, and it was mostly pure sand. I would and think, it was, I think you'd be very, very light CECs. It, it was, yeah, it was easy digging. It was, yeah. it was a nice sandy loam, and so I never saw red anywhere except the backside, the golf course side of the clubhouse. And my speculation is, is they trucked in this red clay from somewhere, somewhere on the island. I mean, anybody that knows the uh, Quinna Cliffs or Gayhead Cliffs, there's all kinds of colorful, beautiful uh, clays um, that you see on this, you know, oceanside cliff. And so they must have trucked them in from somewhere on the island, stockpiled it on the lawn, and then brought it to each green site. But they took water really well, but they were put there because in the 30s, you weren't trying to irrigate you know, like we do today. And so, so they wanted to hold moisture. So, so the greens with a little bit of work, you know, behaved well. Um, the fairways and tees, well, not tees as much because they were smaller, so I could treat them as well, but I could never afford to give the fairways what they needed to fight the salt water. It was just a constant battle. How bad was the sodium? I mean, you must have gotten a lot of infusion of salt. It was horrific. Yeah, the more I watered, the, the the more salt I got, and so um, one of my last years there, I had a picture. I was out playing golf, and one of the guys I was playing with, one of my regulars, um, members, great guy, did a lot of construction for me. He was a carpenter, built a lot of the buildings and stuff, so he was um, what I would consider a friend, and uh so I don't think it was his fault. Maybe the golf carts were a little wonky where they would grab a little, but I've got a picture of him putting a divot back that was wider than I can hold on this screen, just a pelt of right. grass that peeled up under the tire. So they, the fairways would get so slimy in August on the surface and just hold water and, and you know, they just wouldn't drain and they, they, they lost all their structure. So I invariably would end up going out with a flowable gypsum just to try to correct it. But that was a couple thousand dollars every year that I was trying to avoid spending. And so it was it was a nightmare. It was a true nightmare. So let's let's continue to talk about this environmental thing. And, and I'm going to use a few of my uh, silly thoughts here. But, you know, everybody talks about environmentalism and and you hear about, you know, and I love the bioject. I love inoculations. We've been working with rhizobacteria and mycorrhizae now for a lot of years with great success. But you hear these conversations and, and not a lot of it starts with soil. I mean, you I, I would consider you a soils guy. I know you've been, you know, looking at soil tests for much of your life. But, you know, a lot of this this work that folks are talking about environmentalism, it's it, it never really starts as is our passion and obviously our bias uh but you know looking at that soil and you, you did a lot of soils work you had some you know obviously with uh, greg from Irwin and and a lot of folks helping you uh you know study the soil test you started to do a little soils work i mean you were making that foundation right and then coming in with that bioject and uh you know, and, and doing your, what I would call an IPM approach, you know, selectively finding other things. Um, if you were to ask, I mean, I, I can't imagine you're not going to get an awful lot of questions now that you are the president's uh, environmental steward. Uh, I can't imagine you're not going to get a bunch of phone calls from guys all over the country with weird soils, not like yours, uh, and weird environments that are either ridiculously hot or high sodium or whatever it could be. What advice are you going to give a young guy that, you know, is going to come to the uh, environmental steward winner and say, hey, I'd love to be environmentally stewardable, if that's such a word. Uh, what do you tell him? 
It all starts with soils, right? There's there's no question about it. Um, uh, well, and I, I truly believe it, right? I'm I'm a I'm not a I'm not a zealot. Um, I'm a big fan of the turf grass zealot. Uh, Dave Wilbur's a, a good friend of mine. I've had a lot of conversations with Dave over the years, and uh, I, I truly love Dave. He yeah. he speaks on another plane sometimes that uh, Which is good. I I can't even get close to. Um, and in a good way, right? Um, and sometimes in a weird way, but in a good way, right? He's just way smarter than I'll ever be. Way and all of us. Yeah. And so anyway, but I've never been a zealot about the environmentalism, but one thing I can be a zealot about for sure is it starts with soils and it starts with roots, right? Um, I came here and I had, you know, so probably seven or eight tea complexes that were almost dirt, complete dirt. There's hardly any grass on them. At Cape Cod. Uh, at Cape Cod. I bought uh, a bunch of tarps at Home Depot or somewhere and was putting regulation, just regular black tarps because it was March and we have such a cold spring, as I said. So I'm poking holes and throwing seed down and I wasn't smart enough then even to think about pre-germinating seed, but we pre-germinate seed a lot now yeah. in making divot mix and just trying to get a ahead of the amount of play we do here. And so I was doing anything to try to raise the, the, the soil temperatures, number one, to germinate seed, but it's also about just getting those teas to be healthy underneath. And so um, at, at um, and, and I also had problems on greens, right, where I had this recurring anthracnose problem, and I battled that for about a year and a half. Last year, we seemed to get ahead of it. And it's not from changing your fungicide program. You know, it's, it's you know, you can't solve every problem with something in a tank. Right. It really starts with building up a good, healthy soil. I would much rather not use anything any synthetic chemicals at all if I could. Um, I know that's not really feasible, and certainly I'm not sure I would ever try it on greens anywhere. I would agree with that. Um, because I've seen it. You know, my old nursery, I built three greens out of air fire plugs on the vineyard under construction for use on the golf course. The last one became a nursery. And I abused that poor thing. I mean, I just, it, it was a nursery. It was like, you know, it's there as an emergency. Yeah. And so it got sprayed when it got sprayed. And, it, you know, I was always fighting Dollar Spot on it because I just, it, you know, I would, I would put rinse aid in it. If I finished my if I finished my greens and I had enough to spray the whole yeah. thing, I sprayed it. If I didn't, I went and put – I was always going to rinse my tank out twice. So I would put the first one, you know, on the nursery and try to slow down, get the rate up a little. But I'd go out there and I had – you know, I, I mean I had everything growing on that thing known to man because it just got abused. That's um, gotten child, right. And it got abused with water as well. I think I stripped a lot of the topsoil off with the first two removals to go as other greens, the putting green and the second green on six. And so it eventually became all bank grass too. I mean, the thing was, oh, there you go. it was damn near bulletproof, but it would still get disease. So how much different is Cape Cod uh, where you are now from where you were on the vineyard in terms of the environment and the soil? It's, it's very similar, except this place has a heavier soil. Um, it, 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 yeah. it drains really well, but it has a lot of rock in it, mm. and um, it's just a little heavier. Yeah. Um, so it, it's very different in that way. Um, and But climate-wise, it's, it's almost identical. We've got a very big lake or pond that we, we abut, and the microclimates on those holes are phenomenal. So it's similar to, you know, the vineyard where when that water's cold, it's cold on those holes. Um, are you able to do – now you're at an 18-hole course, much bigger property, right? Mm -hmm. And are you able to be uh, – I mean, I think one of the, the – I, I can – I'm trying to visualize what some somebody might uh, – you know, say to you, well, you know, you're on a nine hole course. It wasn't a very big property. It's easy to be environmental. Um, can you do the same thing that you did there on an 18 hole property? And, or could you give advice to a, you know, a young guy that's in the business that's got a big piece of property? Is this doable? Can you still do these kind of selective, um, you know, certain I, soil things you can do? Yeah. I mean, it, it, I think a lot of the program could work. 
Um, you know, you're not going to be able to spray, you know. So we were closed. I, I was able to get a maintenance uh, two hours on uh, Mink Meadows. It was Mondays. Then we moved it to Tuesdays. So the first tea time was 8 a.m. on Tuesdays. Big deal, right? So, um, you know, I mean, a lot of private clubs, it's it's eight or eight thirty every day. But when you're oh, an hour. <laughs> when you're at six, eight's yeah. a big deal. Yeah. So, the last probably two years I was there at least, that was when I had kind of kicked the the sprayer into third gear and was just flying, spraying uh, the biojet out. So I could spray my fairways, my tees, and then my greens all on that Tuesday morning. Now, I was on the first green at 7.59 and waving to the members on the tee, like, you know, yeah. don't run. Don't, 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 don't run. run. Let me get ahead of you. Give it five seconds to yeah, dry, and yeah, off I go. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, and then once you get ahead of them, you're ahead of them fine because it takes no time to spray a green. And yeah. so, but that first green, you know, but I, so that was, and I did all my own spraying. So, you know, it, it was still a fair amount of work. I lived on that sprayer. It seemed like between the bioject, I felt like I was putting ruts in the fairways. I could have right. done it blindfolded because it was the same three passes. Yeah. So to take that program and bring it to an 18 hole course, it, it, it would be certainly more labor intensive. Um, but, you know, any environmental approach is probably more labor intensive no matter what. Of course because you're just applying products more often rather than this, okay, I know I'm going to get 30 days out of this fungicide or something of that sort. It's you know? not as convenient. It's not as convenient. It's not as uh, inexpensive. It's probably more expensive. And so I, I, did, I did spend possibly more, but then I didn't apply um, – uh, an insecticide for grubs, so that saved me some money. So there was some balances back and forth and give and take. Um, I but think it's, that's a real important um, part, uh, you know, a, a point there, Matt, is that, you know, it's the ROI on it. And the same thing is true with good soils management. You get the soil right, you're, ap- you know, I mean, most of our clients in New England are using significantly less fertilizer uh, because they've got the soil working. You know, when you get that system working, you know, it becomes an upfront investment for a much stronger ROI, but it's also peace of mind for you. I mean, you're out there, you know that you're protected and, you know, and you're able to, uh, you know, the system is working. So it's not like you're falling off the cliff every time you walk in, right? Well, that's exactly right. Um, I mean, I had a chemical storage building. It was one of the first things we did was bring in a steel chemical storage building. They were stored um, literally right next to my office. What was my office? I eventually converted that into a grinding room and moved my office upstairs but you know i had done probably every box you know everything that you needed to do to become a a, an autobahn sanctuary golf course it was just it it, it was just something that my club wasn't necessarily interested in doing Um, we were involved in a research project with vineyard golf and Eggertown golf and um, they allowed me to do that with the University of Massachusetts, but only if we were uh, anonymous. So if anyone wants to look, if anyone wants to look up that study, um, we would be the uh, the one that's not named. <laughs> there you go. So um, it, it all starts as a base for sure, and and you know I'm I'm very proud of it. Doesn't have much to do, I don't think, with the award, but. The last took me about seven years to convert those greens to bank grass without um, overseeding. Right. I did it strictly with uh, conventional, you know, uh, uh, procedures. Right. No pulling cores, deep watering, solid rollers, legacy. Uh, earthworks, just building a good base. And when I left, I'm telling you, those greens were absolutely bulletproof, wow. just bulletproof. And, and it was perfect. Um, and, and it, you know, I'm, 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 this is the test here. I'm not sure if I'll get the seven years here, uh, to do this, but I haven't pulled a core on these greens here. In, oh, two really? in two years, and I and I have no plan to. It's it's a deep tining, uh, you know, shallow tining, all just solid tines and sand, earthworks. I've got some greens here that need more than just five four five. Um, I've got one that they rebuilt in the eighties. 
that's oh, got a different mix altogether. Oh, it's horrible. It's just completely horrible. Yeah. So I, yeah. I've been trying to broom in some um, – renovate plus but um with some with some changes to my 1940s or or 30s pump station uh hopefully this spring i'll be able to actually run a uh, you know a single irrigation hose and run a dry jack and we're going to try to inject some some renovate plus into a couple of greens as well was the was the soil chemistry really off when you got the Cape Cod Nash, uh, uh, Country Club? That green is completely different because yeah, they that they one constructed green is different. Yeah, that one constructed green. The rest of them aren't bad, but uh, you know, Greg was here calling on the longtime superintendent Dave Mock and and using Earthworks, and it worked out pretty well. And then they kind of switched, and then the two years previous to me, I don't think they were using any organics. So you had a little so, carbon base to build up, and you had something to work off of it it, it it needs some more love still and we're still working it but uh i hate to tell you this but uh, as i told you when we started um an hour is going to go by like that buddy uh let me ask you this um so you're the uh president's award for environmental stewardship do you get like a crown and you have to go around and do presentations i mean <laughs> are you are you do you have a responsibility with this wonderful award are you going to be doing any talks on it I, you know, I don't, I don't know. I have not been asked yet. I, when, when, um, when I hit 19 years with the Bioject, I was asked to speak at the main turf grass conference. Oh, and go. then I spoke at the national on a panel discussion for low input maintenance with Chris Tritabaugh and, uh, Jason Haynes. And so, you know, I think I was the, I was the cream and the Oreo cookie there with the two, <laughs> two smart guys and sharp guys that are, know that you know, is. knocking it out of the park. And I was just the guy doing what I do. Yeah. But, um, one of the things I learned that struck me when I was at the mass, uh, main turf grass conference, there was a guy there in charge of 27 municipal holes and they wanted him to go a hundred percent organic. There's a big push in Maine for that stuff as well as Cape Cod and, and other places. And this guy said to me, he talked them into this approach that I thought made the most sense of anything I've ever heard. Talk about an old Yankee, New Englander. He said, how about I give you one of the nine and we just rotate every three years? And he said, it's been working out perfectly. By the time I'm absolutely crushed with grubs, I can come back. It's back on the rotation yeah. and I can treat it for two more years. By the time I'm actually inundated with weeds, I can come back and spray either for crabgrass or other weeds. And I thought, why can't every golf course, you know, that wants to go this way? That we we had a municipal on the on the Cape last year that the town manager just put up a decree: "Thou shalt be a hundred percent organic." That's a and tough gig, as we've talked many, many times. And you know, and again, as 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 I'll wrap up here, we'll just, you know, I mean, it really does have to be a carbon based approach. And you've done a, a great job on that. And and uh, I, I I wish we could go for another couple hours. Maybe we'll get you back when you have your next award or or the next time you're on the cover of uh, some famous magazine and uh, and rightful and, and and certainly deservingly so. But uh, I hate to do this, but I got to run. And uh, and I want to say thank you so much for joining joining us here so like i said when we started now you've finished your your whole tour you've been on the cover you've been on TurfNet. now you've had a chance to be on the earthworks podcast and, and i'm sure this is the bottom of the run for you but but at least at least we had a chance to chat it's been a real pleasure and, and i really wish you the best and i i hope you can get out there and start teaching young guys you know some of the things that you've done because i've always been incredibly impressed by what you've done and all the work you've done and i've been very grateful for your support of us and uh, and i really wish that we could get together and have a beer at the uh, new england show this year but i guess that's not going to happen but uh as soon as that does happen again my friend maybe next year in san diego if you make it out there uh it seems like that's going to be on and then maybe we'll be back into real world again 
Well, I can't tell you one of the greatest disappointments of my tenure on Martha's Vineyard was never getting you to come out. Um, you we promised, tried so many times. you tried, you we were going to. So many yeah. times. And it just, I can't, and it's, I love Martha's Vineyard. The only real vacation of my life as a child was on Nantucket. And, you know, we went through Martha's Vineyard, obviously, and, and spent some time there. But uh, we tried so many times. And then I, and then we were so close, and then I found out, what do you mean he's leaving? He can't. <laughs> leave i haven't been there yet and so, i apologize that is one of my few great regrets in life was i never got a chance to get out there and, and uh, so i know we're long on time but i don't know if you're a bill maher fan but he's got this skit where he he does uh i don't know if it's a fact but i just know it's true so i don't know if it's a fact but i just know it's true that there's no way your wife was ever involved with any of these plans or you would have never gotten away without no, getting her out right. of this of exactly <laughs> no no there's yeah there's a certain control that you can't you can't give up. So it's been it's uh, you know I mean it's funny because I uh, I think I was telling you when we started it's been two weeks from now uh, it'll be um, the compressor just kicked on the one thing I forgot to shut off. Yeah, there you go. If we stayed in an hour, we would have beat it. Yeah, exactly. If we kept it at close, that's all right. But you know, uh, uh, you know, I I haven't been on an airplane for a, literally a full year as of next week. So. Anyway, let me let me say goodbye to everybody. Let me say thank you to you very much uh, and for all your time. Um, this is the Earthworks Podcast. If you're not a subscriber to the Earthworks Podcast, please subscribe. And now that your compressor is running and we can't hear you, I'm going to say goodbye, Matt. Thank you so much for everything. Thank you, Joel. I appreciate it. So, thanks. 